On the rooftop of this great cathedral, the builders have portrayed themselves in stone. Tools in hand, they shimmy up the huge edifice they've erected. But they're not alone. Monsters of every shape and type have squeezed in among them. What the builders raise, the demons, all enemies of God, conspire to destroy. And yet, hewn from the same rock, the artists and the demons both belong to the very fabric of the cathedral. This is the story of art's struggle with its own inner demons. The story begins with one extraordinary artist, Hieronymus Bosch, who struggled with the demons around him and inside of him. Then the story takes a sudden unexpected turn. Art itself becomes the object of an attack at the hands of Protestant iconoclasts. Meanwhile, another painter, Peter Bruegel, puts art on a new footing by inventing a painting of everyday life. The Northern Renaissance ends with image wars. In the struggle between art makers and art breakers, modern art is born. Fortress of Faith. By 1600, Spain was entering a golden age. Already under Philip's father, Charles V, Spain effectively was the center of the Holy Roman Empire. And Spain's conquest in the New World brought unheard of wealth. Spain was set to become the new center of Europe, and yet Europe in this period stood radically divided. Warfare raged between Protestants and Catholics and among rival forms of Protestantism. When Philip ascended the Spanish throne, he assumed the role of protector of the Catholic orthodoxy. He retained the Inquisition, which had been established by his father, Charles V, and he expanded the industry of censorship. But he also began to build, and he built here in the Escorial an enduring monument to the way in which religion and royal power were bound together. In this palace built as a monastery, piety and power are brought together in bonds of stone. <laughs> Philip's bedchamber was built to be an instrument of his piety. One set of windows looked outward towards the vastness of his kingdom. But there was another opening looking inward towards the monastery's church. From within his private chamber, Philip could participate visually in the sacrament of the mass occurring on the altar table. Philip's constant piety was aided by images, painted ones, which the king avidly collected and which he gazed upon while doing his devotions. And among the pictures hanging in this room, there was one strange one that did something that paintings normally don't do. When Philip looked at it, it looked back at him. This painting deliberately disorients. Seven mesmerizing scenes of everyday life, each representing one of the deadly sins, wraps around a circle making you twist your neck to see them. Meanwhile, the central circle, which looks like a schematic sun, is also the pupil of a divine, all-powerful eye that warns, in the Latin inscription, beware, beware, God sees. In other words, the seven deadly sins are what God eternally sees us humans committing. Observing us as we stand before this painting, God sees us twisting and turning, fascinated by sin. 
Philip used this painting for his private devotions. Under the inquisitorial gaze of God, he, the self-styled defender of the Catholic orthodoxy, would have felt himself interrogated for sins committed knowingly and unknowingly. And if he were to draw close to the picture's surface, which surely he did, he would have noticed in the surrounding darkness an artist's signature, Hieronymus Bosch. When Philip built the Escorial, he moved his collection of paintings here, making this monastery one of the world's great picture galleries. And of all the objects he gathered, Bosch's paintings were the ones Philip placed closest to himself. Long dead by the king's time, Bosch is the strangest painter in European art. Celebrated in his time as the inventor of impossible objects and as maker of devils, he remains to this day an art historical monster. By turns repulsive and appealing, he haunts us with an imagery we're meant never fully to understand. The first librarian here at the Escorial, Joseph de Sigentha, was an immensely learned man. He was a cleric, and he wrote a history of the religious order which was housed here in the monastery. And in that history, Sigentha devotes several pages to the works by Hieronymus Bosch that Philip collected. These pages are the best writing on Bosch I know. In them, Sigentha is concerned to show that Bosch was not a heretic. It seems that people thought he was. Now this makes perfect sense. After all, this was a center of censorship, and Bosch is, if anything, a rather eccentric, unorthodox artist. Moreover, there certainly are in Bosch's works certain elements which we can construe as anti-clerical, anti-church. There are clerics in his scenes of hell, and right over there in that picture, a monk features as one of the sinners. A debate still rages as to what Bosch's original intentions were. Many take Sigentha's line and see him as an orthodox Christian with a moralizing viewpoint. Others see him as essentially a fantasist, making wonderful, playful fantasies. Others, on the other hand, see him as an artist who may have belonged to a secret cult. One art historian went so far as to imagine Bosch as belonging to a sect of free love. To make sense of this enigma, we have to take a closer look at his most famous and puzzling work. Any serious fan of Hieronymus Bosch has to make a pilgrimage here to the Prado in Madrid. When it opened in the 19th century, the Prado received the important Old Netherlandish pictures from the Escorial, including that great group of works acquired by Philip II. This is the stumbling block of any interpretation of Hieronymus Bosch, the central panel of the so-called Garden of Earthly Delights. The side panels, they're easy. They represent on the one side paradise and on the other side hell. The problem though is what happens in the middle of this picture, a middle which is not only the geometric center of the image, but takes as its subject a group of unknown individuals doing some unknown ritual themselves circling around a central pool. So what might that story be? Well, it's not a story from the Bible, and it's not a story from mythology, or at least not any myth that has been found by scholars. One scholar recently has suggested that it's not only not a story, but it's not a place, it's a no place or a utopia. The problem though with having no story is one needs a story when one goes into this picture because the moment one looks at it, one is drawn into the details and in order to make sense of the part, one needs to know the whole. 
Let's try a story out on this picture, and I think it's one that the picture lends itself to. It starts off with what we know with the marriage of Adam and Eve. Adam looks at Eve, and if we follow the line of his gaze, which is a kind of storyline, we find that we pass through the picture, through a variety of Adam lookalikes who populate the scene, to the punctuation at the end of the picture, the most mysterious figure of all, the so-called tree man. And the tree man bears an unusual resemblance to Adam himself. It's my view that the picture represents, at one level, a story about desire, about sexual desire, beginning with Adam, looking at Eve, passing through a dream vision of sexual desire, which involves the viewer in complicated ways, to end up at a picture of the self, Adam, looking back at the result of the story, which is not only the terrible history through which we've passed, but is also the dissolution of his own body, the instrument of desire, in the form of the gruesome open corpse. This tree man shows the self, any self, in monstrous disintegration. But the figure may also refer more specifically to the artist, since the word bosch or boss means forest, and trees were the emblem of his town, Setogenbosch. Born around 1450, Bosch's given name was Hieronymus von Aiken. This puts the origin of his family in the German town of Aachen. Once he reached artistic success, Hieronymus renamed himself Bosch to announce where he lived. Sertogenbosch was a large, rich town in the Netherlands. Its center, still standing today, was the market where goods, especially textiles, were traded and wealthy merchants had their homes. The Van Aikens were painters here since the late 14th century. By 1450, they dominated locally their craft, but through Hieronymus, they achieved worldwide fame. New Holland. Holland, New Holland. I'm out. I'm out. Ah, because Bosch's pictures are so strange, people imagine that he was himself an eccentric, producing his nightmare visions in paranoid isolation like some mad scientist in a lab. But in fact, Bosch created his art in a busy family workshop in a building right behind us. There, behind those walls, he, his father, an uncle, two nephews, and a troop of assistants and apprentices fulfilled whatever needs the townspeople here had for painting. Today in his workshop, they sell souvenirs. I'm trying to choose between a Bosch figurine and a statue of our dear lady. but it seems that the porcelain clogs have the monopoly on the market here. In Bosch's day, painters were versatile craftsmen who applied their colors not just to canvases and panels, but to everyday objects as well, such as shop signs and shields. Chiefly, though, the craft of painting was at the service of religion. Painters made church pictures. Church pictures could be commissioned by corporations like guilds and families and confraternities, even whole towns, or they could be donated by private individuals. In any case, the function of donation was always the same, to advertise prestige in this life and to achieve salvation in the next. From early chronicles, we know that Bosch painted several pictures for this church. And here in the choir, in this holiest of holy places, behind the altar, there was an extraordinary Bosch 
depicting the six days of creation in huge format. These and 60 other altar pieces in this church were destroyed in 1566 by Protestants. Not everything perished, however, in that destructive moment. Church archaeologists have removed some of the whitewash that was meant to efface the image and discovered the images preserved underneath. And what strikes us is the profusion of grotesques that exist in this church. In a sense, we recover through things like this wonderful sculpture in the choir stall, as well as the frescoed grotesques that uh, decorate the walls, some of Bosch's sources. Bosch took into his art that long tradition of grotesque marginalia, which had developed throughout the Middle Ages, but instead of having it at the edges of church space, he placed it in the center, right behind the altar. The statue of Our Dear Sweet Lady of Sertogenbos was the object of intense religious devotion in its day as it is still in our own time. And to it was attributed miracles such that pilgrims from distant places came to stand in her presence. And in Sertogenbos there was a specific corporation or brotherhood devoted to the care of the Virgin and her statue. And it was to this illustrious corporation that Hieronymus Bosch himself belonged. The Brotherhood of Our Lady was a religious and a social institution. Although in Bosch's day it achieved a membership of several thousand from all over Northern Europe, its core members were a few dozen so-called sworn brothers, of which Bosch was one. The Brotherhood kept careful records, and these survive in the city archive. It is uh, 125, mm -hmm. and in 125 there is uh, uh, one of the feast meals of a uh, Jürgen Bosch. Yes. It's uh, on this side. Op den verschreven zondag leed daar Jeruzalem, nu les leden in den huize Jeronimus van Aachen. Van Aachen, his Skilder. real name. Skilder. Skilder. And that's one of the feast meals he had to give for uh, all the members of the Brotherhood. And it was, uh, you see in this text, you see it is a very uh, copious meal, it's not uh, simple. Yes. And uh, he had to invite all the members of yes. the Brotherhood, and it's, uh, I think, once in the uh, three or four years, mm -hmm. uh, each member so uh, get over uh, all the members for a dinner, for yes. a, uh, a very good dinner with wine and meat and all that kind of things. Yes. This text, this paper trail back to Bosch is hugely important and tells an enormous amount about the artist. The fact that he stands at the center of the social order, the fact that he's giving feasts to the most important people, the most respected people of the time, and the fact that they themselves understand his role, that he is Hieronymus von Aiken, and that he signed himself Bosch, that he projected himself to a community even beyond them as an international artist. This is the paper trail proving that Bosch was at the center of his culture, not a peripheral figure. Bosch gained entrance to the Brotherhood partly through his artistic talent, but this social elevation had other causes. Around 1480, Bosch married the daughter of a wealthy and prominent patrician here in Sertogenbos. Through her came wealth and status. Bosch was able to purchase this large and expensive home in the best part of town. Through wealth also came creative freedom, the latitude to strike out in new artistic directions. Take, for example, subject matter. Bosch was massively innovative, inventive in the subjects of his pictures. Some we don't even know what the subject is. 
but at the level also of what he paints, there's freedom on display. His monsters are demonstrations of the imaginative freedom of combining unlikely bits and pieces to create a new grotesque whole. Bosch departs from tradition in every way. Instead of well-worn biblical subjects, Bosch paints novelties and enigmas. Instead of rational spaces, he builds chaotic vacuums. Instead of mirrors of the world, he conjures a darkness that erases all. He even paints differently where others created pristine surfaces of layered, translucent glazes, Bosch worked swiftly and directly, sketching his pictures in paint. This isn't to say that Bosch had no clients for his inventions. His work was avidly collected by the most illustrious patrons of the day, by members of the fabulously wealthy Burgundian court. Since the late 14th century, the dukes of faraway Burgundy ruled much of the Netherlands, forcing towns like Sertogenbosch to submit to them. It was war that brought the Burgundian court to Bosch's hometown. Sertogenbosch stood on the front lines of the long and bloody conflict between the Dukes of Burgundy, who ruled these regions, and Gelderland, which resisted their domination. The Duke of Burgundy's troops were frequently garrisoned in Sertogenbosch, and in fact, the Duke's wife, Bianca Sforza, was housed in 1504 in the house right next door to Hieronymus Bosch. So for a brief period, Bosch lived in literally the center of European power, and I think that affected his art. For one thing, it enabled him to get commissions from much higher-born patrons. For another thing, it enabled him to see power in action. He was able to see cities, nearby towns, enemy towns from his perspective, being torched, being turned into Boschian infernos. But I think it did another thing. It enabled him to experience power from the center. Bosch's art is always about us against them, and the us is associated with power. But what did the rich and powerful themselves see in his art? What purpose did his work serve their noble patrons? In 1504, Archduke Philip the Fair, son of the Emperor Maximilian and founder of the Habsburg dynasty, commissioned Bosch to paint a huge painting of the Last Judgment. The surviving contract states that the work be made for Philip's quote-unquote noble pleasure. Evidently, Bosch's works were made to delight. And in anticipation of this delight, Philip prepaid for the commission a highly unusual gesture in the time, which suggests that by 1504, Bosch was in high demand. One of the most difficult things to gauge in Hieronymus Bosch is what contemporary viewers thought when they looked at the picture. Some people say that what people felt in front of a picture like this was extreme remorse. You know you're a sinner, you can see what's going to happen to you, and you're asked to repent now. I think that's true. I think the picture has that pessimistic statement. But clearly the picture does more than constantly wag its moralizing finger at us. I think the picture was made, as the contract states, for pleasure. I believe that viewers of the time would have appreciated the spectacle of imaginative fantasy that Bosch's pictures are. And I think they might have taken pleasure in experiencing that imagination as a cruel imagination, as a cruel form of sport.
Their enjoyment was comparable to ours when we watch horror films. And in fact, a new literature of terror was just then being created. Around 1500, books about werewolves, witches, Count Dracula and Dr. Faust began to circulate through Europe. The difference with Bosch is that judgment was an event his audience knew they'd someday personally see. I must confess, my favorite parts of the picture are the bits that have to do with cooking and eating. I love the way the devils are represented as extremely competent, patient chefs. I love the way one of them is cooking this group of human limbs and head, and she seems to be waiting for uh, the bits to get uh, cooked enough so that she can crack the eggs into it like you make ham and eggs. Or the figure above carefully uh, rotating the corpse on a spit and pouring um, hot oil to keep it basting. I think what Bosch does is he makes hell a kind of reflection, even an extension of everyday life. Bosch makes real fantasies. He brings close uh, our experience of everyday life and an experience of hell as he paints it. In Bosch's day, painters weren't required to be different. Today, novelty is the hallmark of importance in art. Made for noble pleasure, this spectacle of pain anticipates one quintessential modern aesthetic requirement, originality. Bosch is a master at painting the world. His panoramic views are precocious developments in the history of landscape painting. Yet Bosch brilliantly displays the world only then to preach contempt for it. With its triptych format, Bosch's Haywain has the form of a Christian altarpiece. But instead of enshrining something sacred, it centers on the opposite, worthless hay. Hay symbolizes the vanity of earthly pleasure. Rather than elevating us, the picture debases us, mocking our attachment to worldly things, including art itself. This is an image at war with itself. The everyday world is a trap that ensnares you. It's a hole. It's hell. So what's there to do? The traditional Christian answer is this. Turn your back on the world. Live in the world as if you're a stranger to it. Become an enemy to the world. One radical solution is to renounce the good parts of the world by withdrawing, literally, to the wilderness, to the desert. Christ went into the desert and he was tempted by the devil there. In the third century, a holy man decided to follow Christ in every possible way. And so he took himself out of human society and moved into the desert. This man was Saint Anthony. Saint Anthony was the founder of ascetic Christianity. He was the first desert saint, and he was the founder of the entire monastic movement of Christian life. Bosch portrayed Anthony's temptations in the desert. At the geometric center of the central panel, the hermit saint prays in a ruined pagan tomb. Staring at us, he directs us towards a dark interior where Christ points to a crucifix on an altar. This is the proper Christian response. Reject all possessions, die to the world, and turn to Christ. And yet, when we actually look at the picture, we inevitably forsake the saint and Christ for that surrounding devilry that eclipses them. On an outer wall, aligned with the crucifix, Bosch depicts the primal scene of idolatry, the Israelites dancing around the golden calf. 
Bosch pits the idol his own painting potentially is against the truth of Christ. In the St. Anthony triptych, Bosch reduces the seeing eye to the tiniest point at the center of the picture. And effectively, with that point, Bosch says, look away from the world, turn away from the world, look inward. The world that we see is an idol, is a falsehood. And effectively, the painting we see should be crossed out. Bosch negates painting through painting. And with that, an era in the history of art has ended. When Bosch died in 1516, the great edifice of medieval religion still stood firm. Yet in the doubt he casts on external things, including the outward show of religion and of art itself, Bosch anticipates the coming war against images. Just a year after Bosch's death, a struggle began that permanently transformed art and religion. The story is that here, European history changed forever. On October 31st, 1517, on the Feast of All Saints, an obscure monk in this obscure Eastern German town of Wittenberg nailed some pages to that church door. The monk was Martin Luther, and the pages containing 95 theses against contemporary church practices, ignited controversy, then war, and left Europe politically and spiritually divided ever since. It's long been a tourist attraction, this spot where arguably the modern world began. The reality is perhaps more complicated but no less dramatic. Luther may not have literally posted his theses on the church door, but he may have circulated them to church authorities for future debate. And certainly Luther did not want his convictions to divide the church, but simply to reform them from within. But within months of their writing, the 95 theses launched Luther to the center of an international controversy and made him the leader of a protest movement which called itself, appropriately enough, Protestantism. Luther held that salvation came not by pious donations or good works, but by an individual's personal faith alone. To the horror of the papacy in Rome, Luther's doctrine dispensed with the very need for an organized church. This also impacted art profoundly. In Luther's view, images had no role to play in salvation either as miracle-working objects or as pious donations to the church. Stripped of a sacred function, church art lost its chief rationale. In many Protestant territories, artists were now without work, but there was worse to come. This is the Church of Luther's ministry. This is where he preached hundreds of times over his long career in the city. And it is here that iconoclasm, or the violent breaking of images, first broke out in Western Europe. It began in 1521, while Luther was away from the city, in hiding from papal and imperial forces. Interim preachers began to turn their attention to religious ceremony, one preacher, Karlstadt, pointed out that the Old Testament forbade graven images of God. He said that images turned our attention from inward things of faith to the outward material things which are anathema to faith. And then he said that images behind altars, the images which might be venerated by people, could be mistaken for the person venerated, that one could mistake the wood and stone for God that the image could become an idol. And so he called for their destruction. And the people answered. They tore the images from the church walls. They smashed with their hammers the images behind the altars. They cleared all the side altars, and they created an empty space, a space in which, instead of images, one had the word. On March 22, 1522, 
Luther returned from hiding to Wittenberg and ascended the pulpit here in the city church. All ears were on his words. After all, the princes were worried that iconoclasm would spread and that property would be destroyed in the city. Luther's verdict was clear. The iconoclasts, he said, were wrong. Images weren't important, and to take them so seriously as to smash them was to be idolatrous oneself. Images were also unavoidable. When I hear the word Christ, Luther explained, an image forms inside my heart of a man hanging on a cross. It was therefore in this cleansed space that the people of Wittenberg in 1547 erected this new altarpiece. They commissioned the leading painter of the city, Lukas Kranach, to paint it. This picture at the base of the altarpiece, this picture that holds the whole altarpiece up, it makes an argument for its own right to exist as a picture. It shows Luther preaching the word. And the word, according to Luther, is always the word of Christ. But if we follow the pointing fingers of Martin Luther, we arrive at a strange kind of thing. Christ hangs on the cross, his loincloth flutters wildly, and yet there he is in a uh, airless, empty interior. Christ's blood drips from his wounds, yet stops short where the crucifix meets the floor. This is the crucifix of the heart. Neither a miraculous apparition nor a physical entity, it's merely the inner picture each member of the congregation has when they hear Christ preached. An image of the word, this painting preserves the iconoclasm that gave it space. So what does the Wittenberg altarpiece as a whole show? It shows what Christians in Wittenberg in their church do. They are baptized. They listen to the word preached. They take communion. They give confession. This is what church is. But there's nothing obvious about this work from the perspective of the history of art. This is a revolutionary picture. Instead of an imageless church interior, we have images. Instead of images of saints, however, we have memorials to the reformer himself. Over the next decades, the Reformation spread rapidly across Northern Europe, helped partly by the communicative power of printing. And although Luther accepted church art to a limited degree, others continued to advocate the full-scale breaking of images. The destruction wrought by iconoclasts was huge. In certain parts of Germany, the Netherlands, and England, whole traditions vanished without a trace. Yet images survived, and the ways they survived are fascinating. Sometimes iconoclasts destroyed statues and then left them standing as ruins to show that the statue was impotent. Sometimes objects were collected by iconoclasts and put into special chambers called idol chambers, there to be mocked for their impotence. But mostly, images survived by being withdrawn from church space, by being neutralized, by being taken into a new form of appreciation, into the beautiful chambers of the art collection. The paintings gallery with the oldest historical roots is here in Vienna. This city was the last seat of the Habsburg dynasty, and when a national museum opened here in the late 19th century, it took its core from the imperial Habsburg collections. This is one way images get saved from their enemies, the iconoclasts. Extracted from the church, they're displayed as harmless objects, useless for salvation, but appreciated for their rarity, craftsmanship, and beauty. The great art museums of Europe arose from this exodus of images from the church. Rescuing sacred art for worldly use, art collectors stimulated new, entirely secular forms of art. Out of this desire to gather, preserve, and display, 
modern art itself was born. Emperor Rudolf II ruled over Central Europe in the late 16th century. He passionately collected one extraordinary painter from the Netherlands who renewed and brilliantly revised the diabolical art of Bosch. The works of this Renaissance master are the jewel in the crown of Vienna's museums. I know of no more valuable room in the world than this one, containing most of the works of Peter Bruegel. Painted on oblong wooden panels of about the same big proportions, these familiar icons of Bible history, peasant festivals, children's games and landscape are all in equal measure monumental and intimate. All command the same grand space where they now hang, yet each one speaks candidly, one-on-one, -on -one, to the single viewer who, drawn into their details, will feel that the picture's view is theirs and theirs alone. Bruegel's paintings seem completely natural to us today. Filled with recognizable human actors, they seem beyond the old customs and old stories that they so meticulously record. Bruegel is the most modern and accessible of the old masters. You don't have to be learned to like his pictures. In fact, Bruegel likes to mock the learned figures, the know-it-alls, in his works. Portraitist of the people, Bruegel remains an immensely popular artist, the stuff of jigsaw puzzles and posters. This explains the immense crowds that jam the Bruegel room in summer. Bruegel delights and communicates with everyone, everywhere. He also returns us to the historical moment when art took personal enjoyment as its basic task. One of his works takes up the theme of painting's departure from religion. The subject of the picture, Christ carrying the cross, lies concealed in a spectacle of contemporary life. Bruegel does more than update the Bible story. He shows how people would act if Christ were crucified in Bruegel's present-day Flanders, how they rush to get a good view of the action. The ring of onlookers rhymes with a torture wheel above, suggesting that the true instrument of Christ's torment was callous humanity. Both these circles rhyme with the flow of people to Calvary, indicating this has happened in ceaseless repetitions that grind down the earth. The Christian message becomes universal, but the Christian myth recedes. With this painting, Bruegel takes leave of religious art. Henceforth, he seems to say, painting can explore the human world directly through scenes of everyday life. Bruegel's farewell was timely, painted in 1564 on the very eve of iconoclasm in the Netherlands. The carrying of the cross rescues the sacred icon from destruction by turning it into a modern work of art. How did Bruegel make this turn from sacred imagery to everyday life? To find the answer, we have to return to the artist's beginnings in the city of Antwerp. Bruegel was born in the Netherlands around 1530, about a decade after Bosch's death. When he settled in Antwerp in the 1550s, this city was not only Europe's trade capital and the center of a huge paintings industry, with the development of printing techniques, it was the world center for the reproduction of art. Bruegel entered Antwerp's economy when the drawings from a journey he made across the Alps to Italy were turned into prints. This transformation was a collective endeavor. Professional engravers transferred the sketches onto copper plates, and a printer published these engravings. Bruegel's printer was Hieronymus Koch. 
Bruegel was way more famous in his lifetime for his prints than for his paintings. And for me, one of the most evocative landscape prints is this one, which is called Rustic Solicitude. And what Bruegel gives us in this landscape is extraordinary. Wherever we look, no matter how far into the distance, no matter where in the picture our eye falls, there's always going to be something for us to see. It's almost like landscape for Bruegel is an experience park. And wherever you look in the original print, because it's so beautifully made, that experience is both of a faraway world and of beautifully crafted black lines. And it's this combination of intricate drawing and a vast world that makes these prints so wonderful to look at. Bruegel's monumental series of large landscapes are the perfect combination between the local skill of a landscapist with the most distant or exotic type of landscape, namely the Alps. Nothing could be further from the life world of a Flemish artist and his public than these lofty peaks from which you see the world. In Bruegel's day, the Alps weren't considered to be beautiful or scenically sublime. They were considered to be bizarre, monstrous, and grotesque. And in the next project that Bruegel did in collaboration with Hieronymus Koch, the grotesque comes to the fore again. Bruegel's series of the vices, or the seven deadly sins, reach back to another local or vernacular tradition of art, namely that of Hieronymus Bosch. Bruegel launched his career then as simultaneously a landscapist and as a Bosch imitator. And it's here that our story comes together. Bruegel was called by his friends another Hieronymus Bosch. He is a renaissance of the Boschian image. What did Bruegel and his public see in this strange master from a bygone era? By Bruegel's time, radical Protestantism had reached the Netherlands. In 1566, iconoclastic riots broke out in Antwerp and spread to all the surrounding cities and towns. At such a time, Bosch's nightmares would have seemed real. The war against the images carried out inside his paintings now was waged against art itself. The reprisals against the iconoclasts were violent and bloody. Instead of images, bodies were broken. And Bruegel, living in this city at that time, would have experienced firsthand the kind of suffering and kind of violence which he specialized in in his pictures. He would have been vindicated in his idea that visibly evil did not come from some devil out there, but came from inside humanity where Bosch displays human suffering against the backdrop of a cosmic struggle between God and Satan. Bruegel reveals the perpetrator of evil to be none other than ourselves. Even the triumphant skeletons aren't demons anymore, but personifications of war. In the mid-16th century, some of Europe's most avant-garde thinkers lived in Antwerp. One of Bruegel's closest friends was the great mapmaker, Abraham Ortelius. Gathering, comparing, revising, and publishing together charts of all known parts of the world, Ortelius invented a new type of object, the atlas. Previously, Atlas had been a mythic giant shouldering the world, now Atlas was a book you could hold in your hands. Like an Atlas, Bruegel's landscapes seek to picture entire worlds. Observing their vista from a high point of view, they induce in us a giddy feeling of motion, of being anywhere in the blink of an eye. And in his great paintings of the seasons, he makes his atlas include not only space, but time as well. Aboard Vienna's Ferris wheel, the bustle of the amusement park below fades from view. And as it does, you feel yourself growing distant from the world. Ortelius and Bruegel felt a certain kinship with one another, perhaps because both enabled armchair travel 
Ortelius through his maps, Bruegel through his landscape views. For both, armchair travel fostered a certain attitude towards experience, allowing the viewer to behold the world from a great distance. It encouraged stoic detachment. At its best, detachment softens the blows inevitable in life. At its worst, it encourages callous indifference. And it's this cruel perspective which was play-acted here, in this Ferris wheel, by Orson Welles in the role of Harry Lyme. Bruegel shared with Ortelius something beside detachment. He was a passionate collector. But whereas Ortelius gathered facts about the world, Bruegel collected human fictions. He produced three encyclopedic paintings which, taken together, make an atlas of culture. In one, Bruegel gathers proverbs and translates them into absurd but plausible performances. In another, he collects children's games. And to these compendia of language and play, he added a third, encompassing the universe of customs. At first, the battle between Carnival and Lent looks like some Boschian fantasy. But closer inspection reveals that the monsters are villagers in homemade carnival gear. Instead of the devil behind the mask, Bruegel shows the devil to be a crude mask. And in the costume dramas occurring before the church, Bruegel reveals religion to be but a human custom as well. At a time of warfare between Protestants and Catholics, Bruegel shows the folly of religious absolutes. My father was born and raised just a stone's throw away from here. He loved the Prater Amusement Park above all places. And when I was a child, he brought us as a family here so that he could paint motifs like these. We loved the crude surrealism of these rides, how their homemade absurdities mingled with the strangeness of everyday life. I think Bruegel had a similar attitude, but 400 years before. For him, Carnival and the world of popular entertainment were a royal road to a new painting of everyday life. Here we can sense the difference between Bosch and Bruegel. Bosch unmasks everyday reality to reveal the devil pulling the strings behind the scenes. Bruegel goes a step further. He unmasks the devil and finds there a human actor, while meanwhile everyday reality becomes strange and unfamiliar. It's like this. Bosch builds great ghost rides. Bruegel, on the other hand, paints them as they stand there, with the paint peeling from them, and the people riding them as entertaining as the rides themselves. In Bruegel, peasants are timeless representatives of humanity. They replace the gods and heroes of classical art. By painting their simple costumes and customs, Bruegel makes his own art seem natural and timeless as well. Whereas other Renaissance artists, both Northern and Italian, struggled to speak the dead visual language of antiquity, Bruegel learns a living vernacular we still can understand today. As tourists, we want to have an authentic experience of our destination. We want things there to be local, local foods, local buildings, local people, everything typical of the place. The trouble is, if we can get there, it won't be entirely local anymore. We seek, impossibly, an enclave untouched by ourselves, disguised as a peasant, because he wants the natives there to act naturally, so that he can paint them as they are without people like himself. 
He's after unspoiled customs and authentic costumes of people unaware or unaffected by the larger outside world. In a word, Bruegel seeks the primitive just round the corner, and it's there in these enclaves of innocence that he stages a painting of everyday life. Religious art didn't end here, but Bruegel showed how the life of simple folk encompassed all human experience. He thus paved the way for later portraitists of the ordinary and everyday, like Rembrandt, Hogarth, and Warhol. In this tradition, truth is no longer an absolute, as it was for Bosch. The product of human culture, truth now is relative, its certitudes now absurd. With Bruegel, we feel we stand on our side of the threshold to the modern era. Bruegel finds his roots in the art of Hieronymus Bosch and through him in a medieval tradition and in the earliest forms of Netherlandish art. But Bruegel reaches back to Bosch in order to project painting forward beyond the image wars towards its new modern autonomous condition. Indeed, like Bruegel, all the artists of the Northern Renaissance are both strange and familiar. All belong to a deep and foreign past, yet all stride precipitously towards the modern age. Unsurpassed master builders of imagery, they have succeeded even 